Let us now make our voices heard. I pledge to serve and to push my country. I pledge to live like a citizen. Welcome to Citizen University TV. I'm Eric Liu. In today's episode, we're going to talk about moving from protest to power. We live in an age of protest. On campuses and public squares, in streets and social media, protesters all over the world are challenging the status quo. Protests can thrust new issues onto the local or national or even global agenda. And protests can certainly activate people who have long been on the sidelines of civic life. But while protest is often necessary for social change, it is rarely sufficient. What happens after the march, after the rally? In order for protests to bring about lasting positive change, a few things have to happen. Voters have to be mobilized. They have to then cast ballots. And then that has to change the composition and the priorities of government itself. Today, we're going to talk about three core strategies for converting the energy of protest into durable political change. First, expanding the frame of the possible. Second, choosing a defining fight. And third, finding an early win. Let's start with expanding the frame of the possible. Think about any issue you care about. Think about the change that you would like to see in the world. Now, how many times have you been told by somebody, well, that's just never going to happen. That's a nice thought, but that's wishful thinking. It's just not possible. In fact, it may or may not be possible. But when somebody says that to you, be very clear. What they are doing is they are trying to define the boundaries of your civic imagination. What the powerful citizen does is push back. The powerful citizen tries to expand the frame of the possible and to redefine the boundaries of civic imagination. The powerful citizen asks over and over again, what if? What if we did have an audacious goal? What if we did mobilize different forms of power, people power, money power, ideas power? What if we were able to mobilize those forms of power and get the results that we wanted? That act of imagining in the first place and being audacious about it and not taking as given the givens of contemporary political life is something that we've seen in the wake of all of the protests that started in Ferguson, Missouri and have spread around the country and have built into a movement called Black Lives Matter. And in these protests, yes, there have been people who have been specifically arguing about police brutality and about changing the rules, but the protests have converted into something else. Some of these activists have gone on to push for new city council members or new prosecutors. Some have gone on to be parts of commissions that are building new policy frameworks for social justice and racial justice. Some are even running for office. But one particularly audacious and imaginative example of converting protest to power is something called Campaign Zero. Campaign Zero was started by four members of the Black Lives Matter movement. And they have decided to set this big goal to reduce down to zero the number of police killings of unarmed civilians. Zero. Now, they're doing this not simply by setting that goal, but by laying out an entire robust agenda of policy changes, local, state, and national, and an agenda of things that we, the people, as citizens, have to learn to do differently in relation to one another and in relation to law enforcement. That work of expanding the frame of the possible in Campaign Zero is both imaginative and concrete. And it's the concreteness that is really important in coming to our second strategy here choosing a defining fight. Now, one of the things about a defining fight in any issue is simply this. People don't think about politics in the abstract. They don't think about civic issues merely in theory. They think about them in contrast and relief, A versus B. And so on any issue, the question is, how do you frame the choice? How do you frame the issue in ways that are most advantageous to your side, to find that terrain and put and confine the other side to the least advantageous terrain. Consider an issue like immigration, illegal immigration in particular. People who are opposed to and fearful of illegal immigration have really done an excellent job of reducing down this question to a single word, which is calling the people who are undocumented and unauthorized immigrants illegals. By calling somebody an illegal, you're doing a few things. You're humanizing this issue, which is complicated and full of a lot of policy, into a single person, but you're defining that person as inherently a lawbreaker. Their very personhood, not just their acts, but their very personhood 
is a threat to the rule of law and a threat to our security. That notion of a person as illegal is one framing. On the other side, though, you have a group of young activists called the Dreamers. Dreamers are young, undocumented activists who have been pushing for something called the Dream Act, which would give people who were brought to this country at a young age, illegally, uh, but have essentially only known this country, give them a pathway to citizenship if they're willing to go to college or serve in the military. And this idea, then, of reframing the immigration debate and the deba debate around illegal immigration as dreamers and aspiration, as opposed to threats posed by illegals crossing our border, creates this contrast and this definition of a choice. Now, wherever you may sit on this issue, the fact is that both sides have been very effective at trying to personify and humanize the issue in a way that defines terms to their advantage. And that is crucial. It's not just the abstract, it's making a choice. Now, the third strategy then of converting protest to power builds on that, and that is finding an early win. Take, for instance, the rise of the Tea Party. When the Tea Party came to power, uh, and came to prominence uh, in the wake of the financial collapse in the United States, they did a whole bunch of things. They didn't just start out saying, we want to wholesale change the relationship of government to the economy. They first started by showing up at congressional town meetings and dominating those town meetings in a way that got a lot of media attention. Then they started running local candidates for local offices. Then they started in primaries challenging incumbent members of Congress. And as they did these things, one by one, they created the sense of momentum that began to build ultimately into a takeover of the House of Representatives and a shift not only in the Republican Party, but a shift in the frame of what was possible in Congress and in national politics. That same kind of building and momentum from small victories to larger ones, taking partial wins and turning them into bigger ones, is really also the story of the marriage equality movement in the United States. Today, that's the law of the land. But it didn't start out that way. It started out with activists decades ago deciding they're going to make a fight in a city, maybe in a state. And not a fight for full-on marriage equality initially, but a fight, for instance, for civil unions in one jurisdiction. And that win could piggyback onto another so that as a city decided, yes, we are going to authorize gay marriage, states started doing the same thing. And all of these things created this global sense of victory that involved mobilizing voters, pressuring legislators, changing social norms so that ultimately the United States Supreme Court had to rule in favor of marriage equality. Now, however, however you may feel about the Tea Party or about marriage equality, the fact is that in both cases, these movements have been successful at converting the energy of protests and marches and anger in the streets to small wins that add up to bigger wins. And that is the arc of activity in converting protest to power. Now, one of the great case studies of this same combination of strategies, of expanding the frame of the possible, choosing a defining fight, and then getting early wins and building on them, can be found right here in Seattle on the fight for $15 minimum wage. Let's learn a little bit more now about that fight and how it unfolded. SD workers, minimum wage workers are no longer teenagers. They're tending towards, you know, their 20s and 30s. <laughs> their parents, their single mothers. Mama. They're disproportionately women. Who is a typical minimum wage worker? It is somebody who's worked really hard all their life. An increasing proportion of minimum wage workers are college educated workers. Many of them are high school graduates. Most of them are working really hard, cobbling a living together somehow with two or sometimes even three jobs and not being able to get by. In November of 2012 is when New York fast food workers went out on strike. <laughs> Seattle was one of the first six or seven cities where fast food workers went on strike. By and large, those workers told us that they needed higher wages. Workers saw other workers across the country go on strike and said, we started having worker meetings. The issues that you know were resonating in New York and Detroit were resonating for our workers here, and they made a decision to go out on strike in late May 2013. The idea that workers could win $15 an hour seems so seems so out of the box at that point. If you want to see where the $15 an hour demand came from, it came from fast food workers. It came from low wage workers themselves, all around the nation. The entire nation's eyes were on CPAC and whether the small town, you know, 
just south of Seattle was going to be able to pass a, you know, a living wage, a minimum wage for workers. And so once voters passed $15 in SeaTac, um, our fast food workers joined with airport workers to physically bring that 15 into Seattle. Strike, 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 strike. That year itself, it was clear to me that $15 an hour was in the air. And because we recognized that correctly, we made that a central uh, plank of our campaign platform when we ran for city council in 2013. And it was clear, by the time we won our campaign in November of 2013, the, the city of Seattle was abuzz with the demand for $15 an hour. I think it was absolutely historic, not only that we passed $15 an hour, less than six months since we officially launched the 15 Now campaign, but also that we got a unanimous vote on the city council. When we won, when the city council took the vote, our workers were so joyful. And Carolyn DeRocher, uh, who was one of our first fast food strikers, she said when I walked out, uh, I felt like a human being again. She said, I went on strike and I changed the course of, you know, of history and what work means and the value of work. Now to tell us about the fight for 15 is the guy who literally wrote the book about it, uh, David Rolfe, uh, who is the president of SEIU 775 and the author of The Fight for 15 uh, and a catalyst in the fight uh, here in Seattle uh, to increase the minimum wage. Welcome, David. Thanks for having me, Eric. Um, so, uh, you know, this book, uh, which is uh, just out right now, describes uh, in so many ways how this movement emerged. And take us back really to the very beginning um, not even in Seattle, but just how this movement uh, uh, was first birthed. Yeah. You know, I think we have to start by understanding Americans have faced a 40-year wage freeze and that work doesn't pay any more in this country, not because we're less productive, less educated, but because we made a set of bad policy choices that ended up lowering wages for the bottom 90% of income-earning Americans over a generation. And in November of 2012, a group of fast food workers in Brooklyn, New York, only a couple hundred of them, had the courage to walk off their job at chains like McDonald's, KFC, Taco Bell, Wendy's, and not to protest something their employer specifically did or didn't do, but to protest the structure of an industry built on low-wage work. And at the same time, here in our area, workers in SeaTac were organizing, demanding 15 in a union in the subcontracted jobs at the airport that used to be living wage jobs a generation ago, but now are minimum wage jobs, cleaning planes, putting fuel in jets, handling baggage. And that then came together with a series of echo strikes around the country, rolling through the Midwest in the spring of 2013, until on May 29th uh, in the evening uh, in Ballard, a woman named Carolyn DeRocher walked off the job at her Taco Bell, brought her two coworkers with her, shut down the restaurant, and that became then the spark that launched the following day thousands of workers in Seattle going on strike, marching through the street, and demanding 15 in a union. You know, that, that contagion of direct action and protest uh, was happening in part before and in part parallel with uh, a larger strategic uh, and political effort on your part uh, to coordinate some of these activities and to think, wow, there's this energy here. How do we focus this and direct this toward uh, a policy agenda change? And, and describe that kind of parallel effort. To well. Clearly, the Fight for 15 has captured the imagination of Americans, and it did so almost from its first moment. Uh, the first day of national strikes in August of 2013, the New York Times wrote that the uh, civil rights marchers had it right 50 years ago and the fast food strikers have it right today. Because there's something going on in this country where Americans are just sick of waiting for Congress or CEOs to do the right thing, and they're ready to make work pay again. Uh, but, but once you have that kind of expression of, you know, we're mad as hell, we're not going to take it anymore, and it's either walking off the job or organizing strikes or organizing marches in the streets, uh, that conversion uh, uh, from protest to durable political and policy change 
uh, uh, required a bit of architecting. I wouldn't say control because it's a, you know, it was a very uh, you complicated if thing. You, if you call a strike and no one shows up, you don't really have much power. Yeah. So here in Seattle, for instance, kind of walk us through that. Sure. Arc there were two of, things happening at once. One was the, those airport workers who had been organizing for three years down at SeaTac, decided they instead they, they were again, sick of waiting for Alaska Airlines or the Port of Seattle to do the right thing, and they qualified a ballot measure to raise their minimum wage to $15, along with paid sick leave and other provisions. And then the fast food strikers here in Seattle um, really used the, uh, the timing of the city municipal elections to make this demand on City Hall, right, and to ask the mayoral candidates to come and debate low-wage worker issues and tell the public how they would live on a $9 and 18 cent budget themselves if they had to. And uh, this became a giant issue in the municipal elections, both in SeaTac and in Seattle. And I think what we didn't see coming is that it became a national issue. Mm -hmm. That we had BBC and uh, camera crews and NewsHour camera crews in SeaTac covering those workers' efforts. And it really became a, a huge story in the, those national elections. Well, it's fascinating when you compare SeaTac uh, and Seattle, these two different modes, one in SeaTac of citizens organizing to get a me measure on the ballot, yep. um, and in Seattle, citizens organizing to pressure elected representatives on their council uh, and mayoral candidates to uh, change mm -hmm. uh, policy. In both cases, though, I want to rewind half a step. Sure. 15, yep. right? 15 itself was a a choice to define the fight a certain way. It wasn't simply saying we want higher wages or right. this wage is too low. That's right. um, how did the crystallization of defining the fight around 15 occur? You know, we could say there a, was a precise science behind 15, <laughs> but the reality is it was a bold, uh, aspirational, morally compelling demand that inspired people to walk off the job. Right? Just like we didn't fight for the 8.15 hour day or the 7.92 hour day, we were fighting for 15. And that was, uh, you know, here's the thing. For too long, we've had a debate where the Republicans want to do no minimum wage increases and the Democrats offered a nickel here and a dime there. Well, a nickel and a dime doesn't really solve anyone's problems. It doesn't make, mean you can afford the rent. It doesn't mean you can certainly replace your broken dryer or, you know, pay off your credit card debt or... Uh, fix the leaking, the leaking roof, but 15 was actually inspiring because it was going to change people's lives, now, and that's what really ma made it a catalyst. Part of the story that you tell in this book, The Fight for 15, um, is about an experience we share together, yeah. and for full disclosure, we both served uh, on the task force yeah. that the mayor of Seattle created uh, to get this city to a $15 minimum wage. Um, and within that task force, there were a whole range of interests from big business to small business, labor, immigrant mm -hmm. rights, uh, yeah. you know, everyday citizens. Um, within that context of that fight, um, this is the last question I want to pose to you. How did you frame things in order to uh, craft a compromise that could get us to yeah. uh, 15? And then how did you sell that compromise as a victory rather than, oh, it takes too long or it's got too many exemptions or what have you? Yeah. You know, in the book, I talk about the different pieces of the strategy in Seattle. And one of them was street heat and worker protest. One of them was having a smart strategy around the elections. Another was the mayor who did, a, I think, a really terrific job of walking the right path and saying, we are gonna get to 15, that we're not gonna debate whether workers need a raise, but we want stakeholders to come together and figure out how. And then we also had, of course, forces both on the right and the left pulling to try to influence that commission and later city council. So. You know, I think what we said from the beginning, Howard Wright, my co-chair, and I said, listen, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, and um, we've got to figure out how to make this happen. Because I think, the, to give credit to the business community, they saw what happened in SeaTac, where the wage went up to 15 on seven weeks' notice, and they said, well, we'd rather negotiate than we would fight. And I think that was a really a testament to the good leadership, not only of the mayor, but of some people in the Seattle business community. And it helped very much to have 15 Now and Socialist Alternative pulling us leftward and having forces out there that were threatening ballot measures because that created some strong incentives for people to actually come together and make a deal. Well, it is just a compelling and still living case study on how to convert the energy of protest into durable uh, political and policy change. And David, thank you both for uh, your work in making it happen and your telling the story of it in this book, uh, The Fight for 15. Thanks so much, Eric. All right, great to have you. You get to be here. So what makes the Fight for 15 such a great case study for our strategies of moving from protest to power is that it embodies each one very powerfully. So first of all, expanding the frame of the possible, 
opening up people's sense of imagination. As we heard from David Rolfe and others, it was no longer acceptable just to think about a nickel here, a dime there, adding to the minimum wage. What folks were able to do here was crack open a much bigger conversation about economic justice, about fairness, and about livable wages. But then they didn't stop there. They then went to the second strategy of choosing a defining fight. And instead of vaguely talking about income inequality and a fair economy, they centered on a hard number, $15. A $15 hourly wage at the time seemed really audacious, and in many places still does. But what was great about $15 is that alone, it doesn't solve income inequality. Alone, it doesn't make work fair for everybody at the low end of the wage scale today. But what it does is it crystallizes and embodies the fight. It enables you to ask yourself, could I live on 15? Could I live on less than 15? And suddenly now, what had been a bit abstract becomes concrete and the terms become defined. Well, this brings us then to the third strategy, which is finding early wins. And this was true from the very beginning, the ways in which fast food strikers first were able to have success and mobilize. And then that became a contagion of other strikers around the country. And then folks in SeaTac decided, we're gonna organize, we're gonna put a measure on the ballot. And when that measure succeeded, folks in Seattle started thinking, we're gonna hold candidates for office, for council and for mayor to account on whether they themselves are gonna support $15. And ultimately, the city of Seattle did pass $15. In all of these ways, this fight in Seattle encompasses the intentionality that's needed to move from the energy of protest to the durable change of political power and policy change. But it's not just been in Seattle. As a result of this work now, all around the country, fight for 15 has spread. All around the country, wages have increased. And this has become a whole different kind of conversation in the United States about wages, about economic justice, and about the nature of an economy that includes all of us. This, to me, is one of the exciting parts about this moment right now where people are learning how to convert protest into durable power. Well, every episode, we like to think about a conversation that we're having with you, the viewers. And we invite you to send in your questions and your thoughts. Uh, you can always do that via Twitter, at Seattle Channel, using the hashtag CitizenUTV. And today, we want to spend some time uh, speaking to some of the questions that you all have sent in. So this first one comes in via Facebook from Cheryl Stumbo. And she asks, does widespread incivility in politics play some useful role in driving needed changes in a democracy? You know, this is a great question because we sure know that right now our politics is full of incivility. And one reflex is to say, you know, we all ought to be a bit nicer. We all should be less rude, less raw in our politics. But I don't want to quite go there so immediately because kind of like a canary in a coal mine, incivility is often a signal of something else going on people who are feeling voiceless, people who are feeling cut out. And whether you're talking about people who've been supporters of Donald Trump or supporters of Bernie Sanders, the sense that conventional nice politics doesn't cut it anymore. And you have to be angry. You have to be a little bit rude. You have to be willing to shake things up is a sign that something else working uh, deeply in our politics needs to be heard and needs to be addressed. So I'm not for incivility for its own sake, and I'm certainly not for uh, political violence, but I do think that when you have that kind of rawness that you see across left and right in politics, it's best not to smush it down. It's best actually to ask, what's driving that? Who's feeling left out? Who's feeling left behind in our economy and our politics today? The second question that we've got here comes from Mike Pritchard via Twitter, and it's another great question. What should children do to understand their civic power while they're in someone else's care? You know, on one level, I think there is a parenting dimension to this, but on another level, it's about us as citizens in general. If you think about what a kid learns, a kid is learning from the time they're born, from what we do and what we say. So number one, we ourselves as adults, who are presences in the lives of children, have to model the kind of civic power and the civic confidence that we want our children to grow up with. We have to model getting literate in power. We have to model deciding to raise our hands, to step in, to have a voice, and to find our place. And our children will see that. But secondly, I think it's a matter of simple practice, as it is with anything with kids, right? Sports, music, arts, whatever. And from the time that they're young, it is possible to imagine children as citizens in training, citizens who are growing and developing their sense of what is possible, just as they are on the athletic fields or in the musical halls. And there's a great movement afoot in civic education in the United States right now called Action Civics. 
teaching kids civics not by just what's in the books about three branches of government and how a bill becomes a law, but teaching civics to children by giving them the power to actually go in the community and do stuff. Go in the community and write a petition for changing the way this park is being developed. Go in the community and ask your city council, how come the bus routes ignore my neighborhood? Go in the city and go into politics as children, coming together, finding your voice. That kind of practice matters, and practice, practice, practice is how children become great and powerful citizens. Well, these questions were great, and we want to continue this conversation with all of you uh, on this show. And so please, again, send us your thoughts, your ideas, your questions, and we will, every episode, speak to them uh, at Seattle Channel on Twitter with the hashtag CitizenUTV. And join us in thinking about how together we can weave not only a conversation, but a learning experience about how we find our voice. Well, that wraps this episode of Citizen University TV. Today, we've been learning about how to convert the power and the energy of protest into lasting positive political change. And the question for all of us is, how will we be co-authors and co-creators of what comes next? What follows the protest and the rally and the march? On our next episode, we're going to explore a related question, which is simply this. Who decides? Who sets the agenda in any arena of politics and civic change? Join us for that episode. I'm Eric Liu. This is Citizen University TV. Thanks for watching. <laughs>